news of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech. And it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, flying high on a farm. Semper Fi tattooed on his left arm. Spend a little more in the store for a tag in the back. Welcome. American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I am your host, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Every week on this show, we uphold values that will never, ever die. And this week, we are jubilant because the truth is coming out. One of my favorite expressions that I coined myself is the truth has a very big mouth. If you've been listening to this show since its inception, you know that we have been reporting on Benghazi over and over again, and we have contested the White House's version of events. At last, this week, a double whammy. There are 450 pages of previously top secret documents that have now been revealed, and in addition, a bipartisan Senate report was completed. All of the evidence coming forward does two things. Number one, it establishes clearly and unequivocally that the president of the United States knew the nature of the attack really early on. Within 15 minutes of the attack on our compound in Benghazi, Leon Panetta had been briefed of events. He was then the secretary of defense. He went on to speak to the president shortly thereafter, and he told the president the nature of the attack. Clearly and unequivocally, it was a terrorist attack. Everything that came out of the closed door sessions that are now being revealed, including the uh, Senate's own investigation, the bipartisan panel, everyone on the ground was on the same page everybody understood from gregory hicks right on up the chain of command that it was a terrorist attack and nowhere i repeat nowhere and no one mentioned or said anything about some protest inspired by some video some protests that went amok it was clearly a terrorist attack on 9 11. so what does this mean the president lied to the American people. He lied brazenly. He lied openly. He lied shamelessly. He lied repeatedly. But to all of you, this is now just part of a pattern that you have seen unfolding. He lied on Benghazi the same way that he lied about Obamacare. He is a liar. And the facts are revealing that. The facts are now incontrovertible. Remember, he tried to quash all of this by saying that it was one big phony scandal. Again, another lie. By no means phony. He knew about it on the eve, early on that night. He knew the nature of the attack. He knew what it was. And because he was so concerned about his reelection prospects, he lied to the American people. He tried to concoct a story and it was transparent to many of us. And we cried foul and we are now vindicated. So that was the whole, that was point number one that has come out of all of this. And the second point that has come out of all of this is that repeatedly people on the ground were telling the State Department that more security was needed and the State Department did not follow through. The State Department did not want to um, accept the reports that were coming on the ground and we don't quite know why, but adequate security was not given 
to our ambassador. Do you remember that last year when we covered this story, we sounded the alarm on this show because there was some person, a key individual, and he is a Marine Colonel, George Bristol. We were crying out, where is George Bristol? We need you to testify. And the Pentagon was stonewalling. The Pentagon was saying, we can't find him. We don't know where he is. But shows like this, we kept pressing and pressing. You find that guy and you get him to testify. And he did testify. And you know what he said? It's there now in the transcripts in black and white. He warned. He warned the State Department that an attack in Libya on that compound was likely to happen. And he was ignored. And the head of AFRICOM, General Carter Ham, also had the same testimony in closed door sessions that he had issued warnings to the State Department. So the verdict is in. The State Department was woefully negligent. This attack could have and should have been prevented. And there's another myth that's been propagated that somehow the intelligence, the CIA dropped the ball on this. No, the CIA knew. The CIA was warning that the facility was weak, needed more protection, and there were dangerous elements swirling all around. And so the Obama administration and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton they are now indicted by the facts and by the American people. You knew what was happening on that night and you lied to the American people and that is unacceptable. And even worse, you were warned that it could happen. You were warned again and again to provide more security and both of you did not. Shame on both of you. You have the blood of those Americans on your hands. And you know, this is absolutely an outrageous occurrence. If the truth had been known in 2012, it is highly likely that the president would not have been reelected. And so this entire second term is built on a lie, a faulty reelection campaign. And that is why there is no blessing. The president has been mired in gridlock in part because the entire reelection campaign was built on dissemination. And all of us who have been saying, look at Benghazi, look at Benghazi, we've been vilified again and again and yet this week we stand victorious the truth has now come out and everyone who said to the contrary owes all of us an apology well what has happened this week mccain went on the senate floor and he started to blast the media for failing to have previously reported the truth about Benghazi. In particular, he took aim at the New York Times. The New York Times very recently came out with a large report, essentially mouthing off or trying to prove the talking points of the Obama administration. Well, Senator McCain rightfully said that the New York Times based its report on myth and not on facts. Roll it, Brittany. The latest snow job came in December from the New York Times, that ever-reliable surrogate of the Obama administration, which published a long report challenging some key facts about the Benghazi attack. But as Senator, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to say, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And the facts are stubborn things. In reality, what the Times report does is propagate myths. Let's review some of the facts. The New York Times has been nothing but a shill for this administration. And there is no starker example of that than that bogus report that Mr. Kirkpatrick put together. In particular, the New York Times was trying to promote the idea that Al-Qaeda was not involved in the attack. Another blatant lie. I don't care what you call that the name of the group. They were obviously affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And the New York Times wants to bury that word because they know that if in the public mind Al-Qaeda is linked with Benghazi, it means that the president lied about what he had achieved. By killing Osama bin Laden, he thereafter claimed 
that he had basically decapitated al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was on the run. And yet, just before he was elected, al-Qaeda had scored a huge victory against the United States. And so the New York Times wants to bury that word al-Qaeda in affiliation with Benghazi. But not so. All the reports coming forward indicate clearly and unequivocally the group that attacked that compound was an affiliate of al-Qaeda. Shorthand, al-Qaeda struck America again. Roll it, Brittany. Here are the facts. Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups were present in Benghazi, and they were involved in the attack of September 11, 2012. The New York Times itself reported on October 29, 2012, and I quote, American officials said the attack included participants from Ansar al-Sharia, al-Qaeda, and the Islamic Maghreb, and the Mohammed Jamal Network, a militant group in Egypt. All of these groups are affiliated with al-Qaeda. Yes, they're affiliated with al-Qaeda. As clear as day. Another fact that they've been trying to bury. But this week we got a huge victory because even the lamestream media was forced to report on the bipartisan panel. Listen to NBC. Roll it, Brittany. The night 16 months ago on the 9-11 anniversary when four Americans were killed, including our ambassador to Libya. It's back in the news tonight because of a scathing report just issued by the Senate Intelligence Committee. It says the deaths could have been prevented by better security, better communication. And the State Department, they say, gets most of the blame. So even Brian Williams has to admit that the report is scathing and that the conclusion by this bipartisan panel is that the deaths could have been preventable. And who is ultimately responsible for what happened? The State Department. Andrea Mitchell confirmed that in her report. Roll it, Brittany. Says the attacks that killed the four Americans, including Ambassador Chris Stevens, were preventable. In fact, hundreds of intelligence reports in prior months had warned militias and terrorists and affiliated groups had the capability and intent to strike U.S. and Western facilities and personnel in Libya. The intelligence was really ample. I had an opportunity to review it myself. Was it the State Department that should have ramped up the security with all these warnings? The CIA or both? It's the State Department that's uh, responsible for the security of our missions and embassies. There it is. It's the State Department. And another way of saying that is Hillary Clinton is responsible for what happened on 9-11 of uh, that, that, that attack on the Benghazi compound. Disgraceful. A disgraceful spectacle by both the president and his secretary of state. And that is why by 10 a.m. that evening, the two of them were on the phone and the State Department shortly thereafter posted a bogus story about a video. You know why? Because both of them were responsible for what happened. They knew it immediately and they knew they had to cover it up as quickly and as best as they could. Well, they didn't get away with it. And today on American Heartland, we are so happy to report that if you fight and fight and fight for the truth, ultimately the truth sees the light of day. You are listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. And we here uphold values that will never, ever die. And we uphold the truth as it comes forward. Don't you know, things will change, things will go your way If you hold on for one more day Can you hold on for one more day Things will go your way Hold on for one more day The stories that matter, the issues that count This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I'm your host, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. 
go to that website. It is awesome. Some of the best stories you will read anywhere. And also, if you're a fan of the show, every single episode is on YouTube. So you can follow us. You can hear everything we've said in the past. And you can hear everything we say now going forward again and again if you want to. Well, this week, the president made a very provocative statement. He basically said that if he can't get any legislation passed through Congress... He's prepared to use his executive authority to get things done. Roll it, Brittany. Advance Senate members uh, to try to continue to advance the economic recovery and to provide additional letters of opportunity uh, for everybody. But one of the things that I'll be emphasizing uh, in this meeting is the fact that uh, we are not just going to be waiting for legislation in order to make sure uh, that we're providing Americans uh, the kind of help that they need. Uh, I've got a pen and, and I've got a phone. Uh, and I can use that pen to sign executive orders uh, and take executive actions and administrative actions that move the ball forward. This is absolutely disgusting. The president is trying to provoke us all. His poll numbers are now slipping and slipping and slipping. He's now in the 30s once again. And it's no wonder that that's happening. It's because the media, right-wing media that is, folks like me, American Heartland, we and a bunch of others are exposing this man every week, every month as a liar and as an incompetent. As a result, the people are seeing through him. And he's not able to get anything done in Congress. So what does he need to do? He needs to find a way to save his presidency, save his legacy. So he makes this statement this week, which is he's not necessarily going to wait for legislation. Excuse me? Who died and made you dictator of the United States? All of us have to wait for legislation. You know, there's a lot of things that I personally would like. But I have a pen and I have a phone and I can't make it happen. Why? Because I'm a member of a republic. I have to wait for elections. I have to wait for my party to to, to pick up the piece of legislation that I want, an election to occur, and Congress to pass the bill. That's how it works for all of us. He's not a god. He's not greater than any of us. He is one cog of our electoral process. One cog, and that's it. That's what the founding fathers did when they created our Constitution. You disperse power. You create checks and balances. You make sure that each branch of government has limited powers and limited authority. In the executive branch, he does have certain prerogatives, but he does not have the right to willy-nilly transform or enact legislation without congressional approval. So the question we have to ask is this. Look, he is a constitutional expert. He used to teach the Constitution. In fact, he was one of those individuals that railed against the previous president, saying that he was abusing his executive power. So he and liberals, they know these arguments very, very well. So what is going on here? Why is he doing it? Well, there are two reasons. One is he does need to show some kind of record of achievement in order to gin up support in the midterms and for his party in 2016. And he's sadly lacking that. He's not been able to get anything done unprecedented in terms of the kind of gridlock that has occurred in Washington and how his agenda has been totally blocked. So that's one reason. But another reason is this. He's a gambler. Right now, Obamacare is constantly in the headlines as a policy that has failed and failed abysmally. It's even becoming the butt of jokes. The website is the butt of jokes. And we now have not enough young invincibles uh, enrolling in the program for it to be sustainable in the long run. So every day the news about Obamacare is really, really bad. And he and the Democrats know 
that they're going to get trounced in the midterm elections. They're not going to be able to hold on to the Senate, especially in red state and purple states. They have a number of of candidates there that are going to be running, a number of incumbents. They're very, very vulnerable. And so the Democrats know that in order to hold on to the Senate, they have to change the conversation and they have to provoke the Republicans into some kind of misstep. My guess, reading what the president is doing, is that he thinks either way, this strategy is going to work for him. On the one hand, he'll be able to say that some things were done and that he, quote unquote, championed the people, even when Congress wasn't able to get legislation through. And on the other hand, even if there's an uproar, even if there's a backlash, even if the Republicans try to go down the road of talking about impeachment, he is going to be able to present himself as a victim, as somebody who, especially uh, a man of, uh, of race, a black man, a man of a black race, he's going to be able to present himself as somebody who was unduly stymied every time he tried to do something. He's going to try to play the victim card, the race card, anything and everything to change the conversation from his failed policies to Republican overreach. And that is why Republicans in handling this have to be extremely careful. Look, I am one of those folks who supported the government shutdown last year. And I thought that Ted Cruz did a magnificent job in the Senate with his long filibuster. And I think Ted Cruz has been vindicated by events. Yet, in this case, I now hear the murmurings of, if the president overreaches, should we begin impeachment proceedings? Well, I think perhaps we can start to threaten it, but I don't think we should take our eye off the ball. And the ball is this, win the Senate, capture six more seats. That's all we need. And that will keep the president at bay for the last two years of his presidency, and that will basically have it basically confirms that his second term will be not what he envisioned his agenda will have been completely blocked and stopped and his expansion of government powers can at least be held at bay until hopefully we get a different president in 2016, a different kind of president, whether it be Republican or Democrat, one who will truly curtail the massive expansion of the federal government. So the poli- uh, the, the president's comments are absolutely outrageous. They're disgusting. They're appalling. His use of executive power is deplorable. You'll remember that last year we covered a story by a leading um, scholar, who said that the Constitution is basically something that was written by dead white males. It's archaic, and we should ignore it. And I think the president's really beginning to embody that. He believes that. He actually dislikes our Constitution. But apart from that, he is a really good chess player when it comes to winning elections. Look at what he did in 2012. He knew that he had no record to run on. And so what he did was he vilified Mitt Romney and he lied about his record. And that's how he won re-election. And even if we know the truth now, he's still in power. He's still in office. And he's going to try to do the same kind of, play the same kind of games, enact some kind of tricks in order to prevent what everybody sees coming, which is an electoral tsunami in the midterms. So all of us keep our eye on the ball. Keep our eye on those six seats. We must win them so that we can truly block this president's constant, incessant grab for more and more power. Well, his aura is gone. His charisma no longer captivates the American people. He has been unmasked. So much so that even folks at MSNBC who always try to paint a rosy picture are beginning to ask questions. Listen to what Chris Matthews has to say. Roll it, Brittany. Let me get back to John Harwin. How does this president regain his historic 
the heroic stature which he had. I'm not saying he was ever super popular with more than 50 some percent of the country. Right. But he was seen as a hero to a lot of people, and I think he's lost that for a while. And I'm trying to figure out how does he champion the election and re-election of his friends in the Senate, especially in the South, in red states, and that's what we're talking about here, even in the case of Kentucky and uh, Georgia, Louisiana, Arkansas, North Carolina, all red states. Yeah. How does he go down? Like today he's down to visit North Carolina and talk about unemployment, and Kay Hagan says he's in Washington too busy to join him. It's only an hour ride on the plane. Yeah. You know, this is very strange from Chris Matthews' point of view. He talks about the president having heroic stature to some people in 2008. Well, that is true. Some people did see him as a messianic fi figure, as a hero. But it's not his job, Chris Matthews is, to try to ponder how the president should regain that. It's his job to analyze the facts. And the facts are that even though some people regarded him as a hero, quote unquote, in 2008, there was no basis for that heroism. What had he done? What had he achieved? What great legislative mark had he made prior to his first e election? He had done very, very little. And many of us who looked at his record were saying that. So it's, to me, this statement by Chris Matthews is very, very telling. He's not interested in the truth of the matter. He's not interested in saying, well, look, there was people that saw him as a hero and they had no business seeing him as a hero back then. Instead, he continues to act as a sycophantic champion of this man, asking that question, well, how can he be a hero? How can we present him as a hero? In other words, how can we manufacture the image of a hero so we can get our, uh, our Democrats reelected in uh, the next election, in the midterms? This is appalling journalism by Chris Matthews. It is deplorable. It shows just how partisan he is and how unprofessional he's violated all the rules of a professional reporter in, in this line of questioning. But what is also revealing is this. Look how the Democrats know what is at stake. The red states are vulnerable. Those candidates will be picked off in the midterms. And now they want to find a way to bolster the president's image so that he doesn't bring the whole ship down with him because that is what's happening. And that is why someone like Kay Hagan stayed far away from the president when he uh, went to visit North Carolina. It was a short ride, a plane ride away. She could have easily have been by his side, but instead she wants to distance herself from him because he is now being seen clearly as a political loser. And if you associate yourself too closely with him, it's likely to drag down your chances of being reelected. And Democrats have seen this playbook before. Many of them, especially the blue dog Democrats, remember them. They're the moderates. They came to power with him in 2008. And after Obamacare was passed, there was such a backlash, especially in the red states, that those blue dogs were wiped out. And so Democrats today, they don't trust them as far as they can throw them. And that's what Kay Hagan's actions reveal, and rightfully so. Well, Chris Matthews is looking for a hero. Well, Chris, you're looking in all the wrong places. Obama never was and never will be a hero. You are listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Upholding values that will never, ever die. Would you? The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. American Heartland with Dr. Grace. 
you are hearing one of my favorite hymns. And as it happens, this is Loretta Fuddy, the late Hawaii Health Director's favorite song, according to the music director at her church. Miss Fuddy was a woman of very deep faith. Everyone who knew her spoke glowingly of her. They especially said that she was so devoted to her church that the church itself was like a second family to her. And at her memorial service, the priest said that he was there sometimes even more often than she was. He was such a devote. She was such a devoted uh, Christian. She not only sang in the choir. She also served in the school board, the pastoral council. She even answered phones on Sundays after mass. Well, this woman is at the center of a mystery. A mystery that, according to Maui police, in their view, is solved. But I wonder what you, the audience of American Heartland, thinks. Last week, I published a story, wrote a story, and we also discussed it on American Heartland, called The Strange Death of Loretta Fuddy. You will see it at worldtribune.com. The publisher tells me it has received a tremendous amount of traffic. That story was published on Friday. And I kept following the news every single day to see when the autopsy report would be published. I wanted to find out what happened, what was the exact cause of death. On Monday evening, Maui police issued the following statement, and I want to read it. On 12, 11, 13, at about 15, 37 hours, a McKinney K Air turboprop airplane lost power off the island of Molokai, approximately a half mile outside of Kalapapa. Nine people were on board, including the state director of health, Ms. Loretta Fuddy. It has been determined that Fuddy's cause of death was cardiac arrhythmia, as a result of stress and the manner of death was accidental. End of quote. So we have been waiting for more than 30 days for the results of the autopsy. And this is what the Maui police have released. Essentially, it's a couple of sentences. It's very thin. It's not very detailed. I think there are still many, many questions that remain unanswered. Well, let's review for a moment some of the footage that has come forward. Since we covered this story, there's been an incredible video that has done the rounds. One of the passengers on that plane that went down, there were nine passengers in all, including Ms. Fuddy and the pilot. One of those passengers, Ferdinand Puentes, had a camera and he recorded the scene as the plane went down and as the passengers basically disembarked from the plane and waited in the water for help to come. Listen to this remarkable footage. Roll it, Brittany. Two minutes after takeoff, a sudden loss of power. The engines of this Cessna Grand Caravan, a puddle jumper headed to Honolulu, inexplicably stopped. Engine just made a, made a sound and, and then it just, just happened, you know, you just... You realize at that moment what was going on. All nine people on board know they're about to crash. But listen, not a peep from the passengers. There was no screaming, no one panicked. Ferdinand Puentes in seat 4B was rolling the whole time. I was thinking, is this like for real? The only sound, a cockpit alarm. And I looked, looked outside in the window and I seen that the ocean was just was coming pretty fast. Okay, well, this is an absolutely remarkable piece of footage because we see the inside of a plane and we see the passengers on board sitting there as the plane hits the water. What is stunning, and everybody who sees this says the same thing, Nobody is panicking. No one is screaming. 
everyone is completely calm. In part, that is because of the attitude of the pilot, because the pilot was very reassuring. In one of the interviews, um, he says that he basically told the passengers, well, guys, we're about to go for a swim. The way that he presented what was happening, he made it seem as though, hey, there's a malfunction here. And by the calmness in his own voice, he was very reassuring, we're likely to all get out of this alive. So it's really stunning. I've never, ever seen anything like this. A plane going down, all of those nine people could die, and yet they're all completely calm, no one is panicking, and no one is screaming. These are very important facts. They're incontrovertible facts. Roll the next clip, Brittany. We just hit, and in that split second, first thing I did was look for my life vest. Life jacket? So I was there just fumbling, trying to get it open. It happened so fast. Watch as the floor immediately starts to fill up with water. Water just filled our feet up to our ankles. The sound is muffled because the camera is inside a watertight mount meant for snorkeling, which turns out to be just the right thing. The camera still rolling as everyone makes their escape. 324, less than two minutes after the crash, they're all out. Everybody okay? Miraculously, all nine people on board survived the crash itself. No, and the wing was right there. I figured everyone was rushing as fast as I did. So I just kept on going up to the end of the, the wing and make sure that there was room for the other passenger. Once in the water, Puentes and the others grabbed for any piece of debris they could find. The first person that was behind me, she, she cried for help because she didn't have her life. Life vest on, so. That passenger, Rosa Key, from 3A, was struggling. Water was rough, so everybody was kind of, Holly was trying to get everybody together, but that's kind of impossible because of the waves. Still, everyone is remarkably calm. I was still in shock, like, this is happening still, you know, when I'm going to wake up. He managed to capture this epic selfie before his camera finally ran out of batteries. It, is that fifth? Time stop, and everything that you remembered in your past, your loved ones, and everything, you know, it's, well, I didn't say, say goodbye to them, you know, it's just for the, even that split, you know, like nanosecond, it just, that time stop, and your whole life just goes in front of you. Now, that is really, really, um, you know, heart-wrenching testimony, as he tells us what, he, what this passenger, this young man was thinking. But again, let's look at the evidence. So in the first clip, we saw that everybody was calm as the plane went down. Then in the second clip, we saw that even as water was filling the cabin, and this is usually a moment where, where passengers start to panic. They trample on one another. There's a mad, a mad dash for the door and fatalities happen. Again, nobody screaming, nobody panicking. Everybody made it out okay. And he, Ferdinand Puentes, was so calm, in fact, could sna snap a picture of himself. So everyone was calm. Nobody panicked. Nobody screamed. Now they're all in the water. And what happens next? We hear different accounts from different people. But we do know that Loretta Fuddy made it out. She did have her life jacket on. And she was holding the hand of her deputy, Keith Yamamoto. And... There, there is a report by the Reverend there who, who hears this secondhand from Mr. Yamamoto. Uh, the Reverend, by the way, he had just he was waiting for the passengers uh, to be rescued. He had seen the crash from the shoreline by the time the authorities got wind of it. So he was one of the first people that spoke to the passengers as they were being rescued. He said that Mr. Yamamoto told him that Loretta Fuddy was paddling. Perhaps she was tired. Perhaps she was getting tired as she was waiting to be rescued. But nobody seemed to present a picture of panic. Nobody was having or seemed to have some kind of major anxiety attack. And another reason why nobody was panicking is because early on, they had a sense, even as they're there in the water and the sea is a bit rough, they had a sense quite quickly that help was coming. Why is that? Because there was a plane over them. Josh Lang and his girlfriend kept hovering over them, and that was reassuring to them. 
that, you know, some help is coming. And that's another reason, another reason why they weren't panicking. Nobody saying, I'm about to die. I can't take this anymore. There was none of that because they saw a plane overhead. They all put two and two together. Help is coming. And that's why so many of them were successfully rescued. All but one. And we asked the question in the column, how is it possible? What exactly happened to Loretta Fuddy? Well, we have this report now. I think it's very thin. All we're told is that she died of cardiac arrhythmia. But when the report came out, Loretta Fuddy's brother made several statements to the press. Louis Fuddy said she had no history of heart problems. Now, cardiac arrhythmia usually results if somebody has a history of heart problems. Then this explanation is very logical possible. In this case, Mr. Fuddy said she had no health problems and she was healthy. In addition, he continues to put forward the narrative that we've seen from this footage that everybody remained calm. And it appeared that even Loretta Fuddy was very calm. He said she was not a person who got stressed very easily. You have to have, quote, very cool nerves, end of quote, if you're going to run a department like the department she was running in Hawaii. So she had no health problems. She didn't scare easy. She didn't stress easy. This is the character. This is the character portrait we have. And yet, we now have to have to examine this cause of death, cardiac arrhythmia. And we've got to ask a couple of questions about that. Does it fit the health profile and the character profile of Loretta Fuddy? Not according to the testimony of Lewis Fuddy, it doesn't. And how did the medical examiner come to this conclusion? Usually cardiac arrhythmia is detected while the person's heart is still beating. It's usually, you usually need an ECG, a, a monitoring of your heartbeat while you're alive for somebody to be told you have this condition, this irregular heartbeat that might be fatal. And often in um, an autopsy, sometimes when no other causes are fine, nothing else can be found, they might say cardiac arrhythmia because there's no other evidence. So this whole issue of cardiac arrhythmia, it continues to raise questions. What specific evidence was there that this really was the cause? I think we need to see more and the only way to see more is for the family members to petition that the autopsy results be published so that all of us, including experts, experts well beyond my capacity, my capability, my knowledge, can look at all the evidence that is presented. Because think about it. What are the chances that something like this could happen? All of us run a very, very low risk of ever being in a plane crash. And when you examine that risk with the risk of surviving, but then dying due to cardiac arrhythmia based on a person that has no health history of heart problems and that doesn't stress easily, add all, do the risk assessment of that. To me, it's still very puzzling. It's still very bothersome. I'm not satisfied. I'd like to see more. We're still waiting for the National Transportation Safety Board to come out with, with its report as to why the plane suddenly, why the engine suddenly failed. That's a whole other series of questions we're going to continue to probe. But I am going to stay on top of this story until we get all the answers and until all of us, and especially the family members, are satisfied that this truly was the way in which Loretta Fuddy passed away. You are listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, and we're going to continue to knock down a lot of doors until we get all our questions answered. is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. 
The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. We are getting ready to party. That's right. This week, the Oscar nominations were released. And as you know, I'm a big fan of the movies. I try to go to the movies as often as I can. Before I had two little ones, my husband and I were quite regular together at the movies. Now we try to give uh, both of us often say, okay, I'll watch the kids. Why don't you go and see that movie? And then we'll swap and then we'll talk about it later. That's how we watch movies nowadays. Um, I loved the Golden Globes. My producer said that they were dreadfully boring. They were hosted by Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, but Brittany here just told me that she thought it was horrible. I actually thought the Golden Globes was pretty good this year. Yes, there was some needless vulgarity, but I expected that. I think, though, what pleased me very much is that a movie that I saw over the Christmas holidays, American Hustle, that I come thoroughly enjoyed, that movie got its just reward during the Golden Globe. So I was really, really happy. Um, Amy Adams won in one of the categories as Best Actress in a Musical or a Comedy. And I thought that was a really a beautiful performance, a well-deserved Golden Globe for her. Jennifer Lawrence also won as Best Supporting Actress. And I saw it also a really brilliant performance by Jennifer Lawrence. And I was rooting for Kate Blanchett and Blue Jasmine, and she scooped up Best Actress. I thought that was by far the best performance by a female in 2013. I haven't seen all the movies that are nominated, but the of the movies that I did see this uh, in 2013, I thought there were two really outstanding ones. One is American Hustle. I thought it was excellent from beginning to end. And I think that both Amy Adams and Christian Bale deserve um, accolades and Oscars for their performances. And I also really enjoyed the movie Rush. It was nominated uh, at the Golden Globes. It didn't win much, but... I haven't seen anything about any... It's not been nominated, I don't think, in any category in the Oscars, which is disappointing because I thought it was a truly outstanding picture. Well, let's take a look at the nominations for the Oscars as they were released this year. Let's take a look at the Best Picture nominees. Roll it, Brittany. The Best Picture nominees for 2013 are... It's never too early to find out you've been nominated for an Oscar. As several top films and actors got an early wake-up call, hearing they received nominations for the 86th Academy Awards. Hey, play your part. Having been a frontrunner with several industry awards already, the stylish 1970s FBI sting comedy American Hustle and the critically acclaimed 3D thriller Gravity lead the way with a total of 10 nominations each, including a nod each for Best Picture. I was a free man. I'm not a slave. With the third most nominations is the powerful drama 12 Years a Slave, earning a total of nine with one for Best Picture. This is not a drill, this is a real world situation. This year, out of a possible 10 Best Picture nominees, there are nine films up for the big prize. Rounding out that coveted category are Captain Phillips, Dallas Buyers Club, Her, Nebraska, Philomena, and The Wolf of Wall Street. This is the greatest company in the world! Well, that's quite a list uh, of, of the ones that are mentioned. I am rooting for American Hustle, as I think by far a better movie than Gravity. I saw both of those, American Hustle and Gravity. Gravity was very well done, lots of fun. 
but I think American Hustle blows it right out of the water. The characterization is so rich. The story is mind-boggling. And the fact that it's true is all the more impressive. The dialogue is so witty. The writing is good. The acting is great. And, you know, there's even a brilliant performance by Robert De Niro. He's not mentioned very much when people talk about American Hustle. But he has a, a one scene that is actually really, really captivating. So I think American Hustle is the best movie of 2013. And, and I hope that it wins as the best picture of the year. Um, and I have not seen, though, The Wolf of Wall Street. I'd like to see it before um, the Oscars. My producer saw it and she said, let me quote her. If you look beyond all the nudity and drugs, it's actually a very good movie. End of quote. <laughs> she said that she was able to really get into another person's shoes, and that's what she really, really enjoyed about it. Leonardo Di uh, DiCaprio won as the best actor at the Golden Globes for his performance in The Wolf of Wall Street, and I can't wait to go out and see that movie, even though I know that it has some scenes that are really going to shock me and shock my sensibilities and that I'll really disapprove of, but um, it's, it's well worth seeing, I think, because that, too, is based on a true story. What about the best actors and actresses? Roll it, Brittany. In the best actor category, Leonardo DiCaprio gets his shot at an Oscar with a nod for The Wolf of Wall Street. Along with Christian Bale of American Hustle, Bruce Dern in Nebraska, Chiwetel Ejiofor of 12 Years a Slave, and Matthew McConaughey headlining Dallas Buyers Club also go for the gold. Yeah, I had that one pegged, didn't I? <laughs> Leading ladies up for Best Actress include Meryl Streep, who now has the most nominations ever by an actor with 18. Competing with her are Hustler, Amy Adams, Gravity's Sandra Bullock, Dame Judi Dench of Philomena, and Woody Allen star Kate Blanchett of Blue Jasmine. Supporting actor nods include favorite Jared Leto, Bradley Cooper, Michael Fassbender, Barkhad Abdi, and Jonah Hill. Last year's Best Actress winner Jennifer Lawrence leads the supporting female category, along with Sally Hawkins, Lupita Nyong'o, Julia Roberts, and June Squibb. Noticeable MIAs Emma Thompson of Saving Mr. Banks, Robert Redford in All is Lost, Lee Daniels the butler, and the little indie inside Lewin Davis. So the stage is set for the biggest and brightest stars in the business to keep walking those red carpets and kicking those awards campaigns up a notch. Well, I can't wait to see Wolf of Wall Street, like I said. Uh, so it's a, it's, I can't quite assess whether or not Leonardo DiCaprio performs better than Christian Bale. But I can tell you that from that list, based on uh, the movies that I did see, I think Christian Bale was the best actor of the year. As for the ladies, Meryl Streep is extremely impressive. She receives her 18th Oscar nomination. I'm a big fan of Meryl Streep. I think she's fantastic, and I like her both on the screen and off the screen. She has already won an Oscar several times, um, and she's been nominated now more than any other actor or actress in, in history. Wow, what a remarkable achievement. Nonetheless, I am still rooting for Kate Blanchett, Blanchett and Blue Jasmine. I think that performance was absolutely outstanding. And as far as the best supporting um, actress, I'm rooting for Jennifer Lawrence, the it girl of the moment, but I think well-deserved, well-deserved, a great performance in American Hustle. I can't wait for Oscar night. And Oscar is also making the news because it appears that Harry Weinstein now wants to do a movie with Meryl Streep to bash the NRA. What a dumb idea. What a bad idea. Usually movies with this kind of highly political agenda just fall flat. Look at the evidence. I mean, look at two of the great movies that we're just talking about, American Hustle and Gravity. They don't really have a political agenda. An audience loves movies that are complex and nuanced, and they don't hit you over the head with some simple liberal message. Or look at last year, 
Argo. I was rooting for that movie from the moment I saw it, and I was euphoric when it won as Best Picture, when Ben Affleck picked up uh, the trophy for Best Actor to, uh, Best Director too. forgive me. And that, too, it didn't have a political agenda. It was a story about an event that happened. So I hope that um, the movie that bashes the NRA that will star Meryl Streep and that will be produced by Harry Weinstein will be rejected by audience so that Hollywood continues to get the message that the movies that we want to see do not have a liberal agenda. We just want to see movies about complex, fun, lovable, or outrageous interesting characters in remarkable stories, experiencing remarkable events, and directed by truly creative, innovative people. If we want liberalism, Hollywood, we know where to go. And that would be the Democratic Party. When we go to the movies, that's not what we're looking for. Well, I hope Oscar night's going to be a blast. I look forward to it. In the meantime, I'm the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, upholding values that will never, ever die. Well, if you ask me where I come from, here's what I tell everyone. I was born by God's dear grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace.